Hello everybody, Helen the Russian here. This video is not going to be about rideshare, so those of you who were hoping for that, you can tune out now. This is going to be a bit of a reflective video. I want to share a couple of personal stories, but there is a reason for that. I'm not just sharing them for the sake of sharing. There, there will be a moral for all of that at the end of the video, and it's probably going to end up a bit of a lengthy video so once again um, if it's something that doesn't interest you please do tune out it's I am not recording this one for the sake of gaining more subscribers it's some this is my channel after all and this is something that's been bothering me um, for the last few days and I thought I'd share my perspective on things um, so first of all a little story from my past when i was young um, in my teens late teens i lived in the city of baku that's the capital of azerbaijan back then it was a part of russia of ussr i am just to clarify things i am ethnic russian so that republic was mostly populated by azerbaijanis um, generally a muslim population also lots of armenians um, armenians are usually christian Gen again generally speaking and it was very much an international city it, it was fantastic city i loved growing up in there everyone every neighbor knew each other we were very friendly very often neighbors shared the cookings the bakings the gifts there were a lot of celebrations done together at school, my class consisted of people of all ethnicities and nationalities. Anyhow, I'm going to compress the story to get to the point. Um, when I was at the uni, at the university, um, unrest started. Um, Armenians were unhappy with Azerbaijanis. It had to do with a piece of land in the middle of the republic. Azerbaijanis were not happy with Armenians. There were demonstrations. Um, going on people were gathering but nothing was really happening apart from gathering and talking and then that went on for a few months um, some people were arming themselves but again quietly there was no violence happening and then one day the violence broke out um, Azerbaijanis were kicking Armenians out of their apartments and homes um, people were hurt people were killed I so myself i was um, in the car with my at the time boyfriend we were driving and out of the corner of my eye i saw something coming down from a high-rise building and it was a person someone threw someone out of the balcony and i it's one of those things you want to look away and you can't and so yeah i i, I saw a person landed and yeah that that was something to remember anyhow that went on for a week just about and there was absolutely no action taken by the government either local government or central russian government things were kind of let slide basically so armenians had to fend for themselves and it wasn't happening everywhere in every single block though it was happening here and there so you know you walk through the city and everything seems normal and next thing you know something like that happens or you hear about it because i was ethnic russian we were kind of exempt so to speak um in russia we have internal passports which among other things list our nation it's called nationality in there but it's ethnicity basically so you could very well and that passport you usually carry with you all the time like you carry your driver's license with you in here so occasionally you would get stopped by self-appointed patrols which were just civilians who decided they're going to be patrols and you would be asked for your passport and if it showed russian they just say no go and if you were armenian you might end up getting hurt getting beaten up getting robbed all kinds of things might have happened but once again baku was not it was not a huge city but it was a big city with lots of suburbs so some places were absolutely unaffected and others were but anyhow no government did absolutely nothing although of course they were well aware and that very much includes the police so no one was doing anything no one was protecting anyone and people were looking the other way but that all kind of came to an end after about a week mostly because armenians either flee the city or they were forced out of the city and it kind of calmed down and so we were all hoping that maybe we're going to go back to normal now that this happened. And another week went by. Yeah, it was about a week. And things seemed to be, 
you could feel slight tension, but overall, none of that was happening. Um, and I remember I came home from the uni, from, from the university. It was about 5 p.m. in the evening and everything seemed normal. And I turned the TV on and TV kind of went on for a bit. And then it went and it just went dark. What I found out later, the power bank for the, the only TV station we had in the city was blown up. And then apparently, again, just to compress the story, um, the president of the country at the time, Mikhail Gorbachev, he decided he's going to send the troops, military troops, to um, restore the order. Now, remember that there was no unrest anymore. Nothing was happening. We thought everything is back to normal. Well, he, there were a lot of political motives behind it. So he sent the troops, and when I say troops, I mean th those were military troops with tanks, actual tanks, not lightly armored vehicles, actual tanks, uh, machine guns, um, and all sorts of things, and they just went into the city. It was already getting dark. Tanks went across the parking lot full of cars, so on the top of cars, and of course the, the locals who were... Before that, Azerbaijanis, the, the ones who were gathering, this one, the ones who were arming themselves, they were resisting. There was shooting everywhere. Like I said, TV wasn't working. The phones were not back then. That was 1990. So no cell phones. Lead lines were dead. Absolutely dead. Um, stray bullets. When, when you have massive war breaking like that in the city, expect a lot of stray bullets that killed a lot of innocent people. That was happening. People, there were snipers from the both sides trying trying to gain the vantage point on the higher buildings or the buildings that were strategically located, like say on the corner of two streets. So either one, both the rebels and the army were trying to do that. So people were literally barricading themselves inside their apartments. People were spending, uh, hiding under the beds, trying to avoid stray bullets. Um, it was ugly to say the least. And of course, when... Every time mainly like that happens, a lot of innocent people get killed. People who had nothing to do with that fighting. So there were a lot of elderly kids, um, women who just got killed in a crossfire, who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And once again, no one was protecting anyone. And then the next morning, so that went on for the entire night and military occupied the city. However, when we woke up the next morning, we quickly realized that now Azerbaijanis are dead set against Russians because obviously it was the Russian government who sent Russian troops to do this. And I can tell you, I know from personal experience what mass hysteria looks like. I, I looked it in the face. I, I, I lived in, in, a, in an apartment, it's an apartment building, but not like the ones that you have here in Las Vegas or even most of the United States. Um, the buildings were consisting usually of several what we call blocks. So it's it's one building and there are like four separate entrances and each entrance leads up the staircase and on each floor there are usually three or four apartments. Meaning there is only one way in and out, either through that front door or you can go up on the roof but then you couldn't go, go down from the roof. We didn't have fire escapes back then so there was no ladder going from the roof down. So on the roof you would be trapped. And I remember looking out of the balcony and people were coming in the morning because remember, no TV, phones were not working, pay phones were not working because I tried um, later, a few, few days later, I'll, t I'll get to it in a minute, try to go use a pay phone and they were not working either. So people were coming out of their apartments and back then, remember how in the beginning I said it was very friendly city, so everybody knew everybody, they really knew, meaning they knew the, the, the ethnicity, nationality, who they are, where they live. Um, people were coming out talking about what happened and you could just see like I said I stared in the face up from the balcony I was watching it and it was mostly men Azerbaijani men talking and they were just fueling the fire you know what what, what would start as a normal conversation did you did you hear what happened you know did you hear from any of your friends and relatives they kept winding themselves up to a point and there would be more people coming out because the louder they spoke, other people heard the voices, came out, joined the conversation and before you knew it, 
there was a small mob of people yelling, we're going to kill 10 Russians for each Azerbaijani dead because it's the Russian president and Russian troops that killed our people. And I remember sitting in my apartment going, well, that's it. Uh, I'm done for because obviously they knew I was Russian, they knew where I lived and it was only, in my mind, it was only the matter of time and it probably was until they started going to apartments where they knew Russians were and, and tried to harm us, kill us, do whatever. Uh, that's the time when you find out who your real friends are because I, I was lucky, um, a, a friend of mine, and really he wasn't even a close friend of mine. He was a friend of my boyfriend at the time, but we used to go out together from time to time. So he was Azerbaijani. And like I said, not, not everybody was doing that, but there were plenty of people who were. I heard the conversation that that neighbor, neighbor of mine, and he was married to this Armenian woman for, for over 15 years. They had three kids. He actually told her, he did, she told me that later. He told her she needs to get the kids and get out before he actually killed them. He, because he, he said, I, I would not be able to restrain myself. And so she had no place to go, but she had to get the kids and they were hiding someplace for, for a few weeks. And anyhow, so that, that friend came and, and he wrapped me in um, what the, it, it was the headdress that Azerbaijanis wore, not, not traditional one. It was more like of a fashion statement, but they did wear it. So he covered me and covered my face and grabbed me like that, took me out. So, because when you do everything really quick, no one has time to think, as many of you know. So he kept, kept just saying in Azerbaijani language, oh my God, they killed our brother, they killed our brother, and he shoved me in his car and we drove away. And that's that's what basically, I do believe to this day that, that that's what saved me. And he, he took me to my other friend's house um, in one of the suburbs and she lived in apartment complex, but a suburb was kind of far away from the city. And also mostly the neighbors were Russian Azerbaijanis. And so we literally, we set it out for nearly a week and a half. We were basically hiding, like our friends brought us food and whatnot, because we couldn't go anywhere. And that's another thing. Back then, we did not have, in Russia, we did not have a credit card system or check system. It was all cash. And the cash was in the bank, and the banks were shut down. Mostly stores were shut down. All the gas stations were shut down. Planes were not flying. Airport was shut down for a few days. Um, it, it was complete and total chaos. What I'm trying to relay, there was absolutely no governing, no ruling, no one was taking care of anything. The trains were not going because they were, as soon as they got to the border of the city, they were getting shut up in their villages, so the trains were not going either. We we were literally trapped. And then the shooting, in the next few days, the shooting would break out uh, randomly here and there, depending on where the snipers were or who felt what and, and that has to do with both army and the rebels so some parts of town a particular part called uh, salyansky kazarme that's where the military school was and we called it military town well there was the biggest concentration of fighting in there and shooting in there and at one point now mind some phones did work, some didn't. I, I think it had to do with the, the central um, phone station being able to do certain parts and not the others. So at one point, uh, friends of ours, um, the son, teenage son, got shot in the leg because he decided he's going to volunteer in, in his um, apartment building. He thought they were talking on the staircase and they were mostly like Jewish, Jewish and Russian people. They didn't want the sniper to get on the roof of their building because then all the shooting would be obviously directed to that building. So he volunteered to go and climb in the lock, the, the fire escape on the top. Well, when he went up there, there was a sniper sitting in the other building who saw him climbing. I assume he was a sniper and he shot him in the leg. He didn't kill him, but the kid was bleeding. He was going to bleed out. And so his mother called the ambulance and they just flat out told her that there is active shooting in there going on all the time. We're just not going there. They, they just said that we're not going. She, she called the police. Same response. They said that they're not coming. 
and she was absolutely frantic. She thought her son's gonna bleed out to death in, in her arms, and it's a um, mutual friend of ours who had the car. He decided, he took it upon himself. He had his own family, his wife, his kids, his elderly mother, but he took it upon himself. He drove down there and he said, I kind of sat on the edge of that area and he figured out that the shooting goes in certain intervals and he has about 15 minutes. So he, he figured it out and he went and he grabbed the kid and he, he, was, he managed to take him. My grandfather worked for a military hospital, so I organized it. So this kid, he was a civilian, was taken to a military hospital because military was only for military personnel. So ultimately the kid was saved. He had limp for, he still has a limp for the rest of his life, but at least, you know, he's fine. So the reason I'm, uh, and oh, also, by the way, just so you know, I'm not full of it. That is Googleable. You can Google Black January 1990 and you're going to read the story. However, all the stories that I did see online, although they talk about it, they don't really necessarily tell the whole story because obviously, as you can see from what I told you, it was pretty ugly. There were, as far as I'm concerned, there were no good guys in there. Azerbaijanis, um, mostly it's Azerbaijanis who write the story and they try to present it that you know they were in the right and the Russian government did this, and this is what happened, and they completely, completely omitting the situation when they, the actual civilian Azerbaijanis were threatening Russians. And I can tell you, ultimately, I was able to get out in, in about two weeks. I was able, the plane started flying, and I, I got on the plane, and my parents lived in Moscow, so I, I flew to Moscow, and I stayed there for about a month until my boyfriend called me. I had literally that was january and already beginning february so i only had till may to finish my my degree my university degree and i've i've been studying for four and a half years i only had that this four months left to get my degree and he said look things are kind of okay -ish. i think you should come back and finish the degree because you're gonna regret it later and i'm so grateful for this advice it's it's good to have he was an older lover older older he was i think nearly 18 years older than me but that was a good advice i am grateful to him for that and i did but i can tell you even then although things were kind of relatively calm meaning there was no shooting and there were no violence a lot of Azerbaijanis just stopped talking to Russians. Like I, people that I've known for years and years would refuse to talk to me. Sometimes you'd go to the store and if the sales clerk was Azerbaijani, they just turn away from you. It was If it was a smaller little shop, they just say, no Russians here, we don't sell Russians here. There is nothing here for you to buy, go away. So yes, it turned ugly, but what I am getting to is I know firsthand what it's like when your police leaves you to fend for yourself, when your EMS does not come to help you, when your government does nothing while you've been literally destroyed, why your life in a very literal danger. So it is, I say that so you can understand why I truly, truly appreciate what our police here does for us. They put themselves on the line all the time. And when you think a year back when the shooting happened, they were rushing in when everybody was run, were running out. They did not stop, they did not hesitate. They helped so many people and they, it is my firm belief, they prevented many more deaths because he did at one point when police start showing up, the shooter redirected his fire onto the police versus the public. So I'm going to say dozens of lives were saved through the heroic acts of the police. So that's that. We're going to leave this story to sit in here for a minute and move on to something entirely different. But again, if you're patient with me in the end, you'll understand why I'm going with this. So now many years forward and now I'm living in New Zealand and while I lived in New Zealand I and again it, it, it was my decision I decided that I'm gonna be outspoken advocate um, for a certain somewhat marginalized group 
let's put it that way. I don't, I don't want to get into any details about that, but that's what happened. And because New Zealand is a very small country, only right now is only 4 million. When I moved there, there was, I think, only 3.5 million population of entire country. Yeah, that's entire country. Las Vegas has 2 million population, just Las Vegas. <laughs> Anyhow, um, there was obviously a forum, so I, I wrote a blog, I posted articles on the public forum, and of course, when you do that, you open yourself up to all kinds of response. And I can tell you, although, and, and, and I always try, I was never like extremely on the right or extremely on the left, and it had nothing to do with the politics, by the way. When I talk about marginalized group, it, it nothing whatsoever to do with the politics. It was something entirely different. But because you're outspoken and you're in the public eye, those of you who is not familiar with that, you have no idea what you get back, how much, and I, I try not to use cuss words on, on this channel, but how much shit you get coming at you from so many directions and oftentimes, and it's not, I mean, one thing is to have a constructive discussion. It's perfectly fine to express criticism. Obviously, no one is dead right or dead wrong all the time, but we're not talking constructive criticism. We're talking some outrageous claims, made up stories, people digging into suddenly into your personal life, which has nothing to do with you know, the point of view you, you're trying to express. People taking it very personally and trying to seek you out in actual real life, meaning instead of disputing something with you on, on a public forum online, they actually try to find you and do harm, if not necessarily physical, but, but they do try to cause harm to you, to your business, to destroy your image. Uh, and it's very easy, unless you've been subjected to that, I promise you, you can't imagine what it does to your psyche, what it does to your well-being, and what kind of stress it causes. It's very easy to say, oh, well, just ignore it. I promise you, it does not work that way. No matter how many times you tell yourself, oh, well, you know, just ignore it, it, it gets into your head. It, it causes all sorts of things and anxiety stress been been the least of them it's in fact the reason i chose to be outspoken outspoken advocate in that particular instance because a lot of people deliberately hid themselves i mean they veiled themselves they made themselves really unavailable to general public and definitely didn't participate in any of those forums and they kept themselves pretty much hidden in order to avoid dealing with that because they told me honestly they they know they can't they know they, their psyche is not capable they, they're gonna go crazy meaning they're gonna they're gonna completely lose it they're gonna end up with mental breakdown and i've seen a couple of people coming that close to a mental breakdown as a result of things that they were said about them on the internet as a result of things that uh, people how people express their opinions about them and so i basically i was a voice of those who could not speak for themselves because they knew they're not strong enough so the, the only reason I, i'm talking about this and i've done this for seven close to seven years a really long time and I, and I stuck it out and, and it's okay and I, I came out stronger for it, but I can tell you, I never want to do it again. It, it's, you cannot imagine what kind of personal toll it takes and, and what it does to you. And you cannot avoid, even if you say, okay, well, I, I'm gonna ignore it, I'm not gonna read it, it trickles down, it finds the way to trickle down. Because like I said, once you become this public persona that people know and you re represent whatever it doesn't matter what it is there are people who will hate you there are people who like you there are people who don't care much for you one way or another but these people like i'll give you an example for instance uh, sometimes obviously i did not deliberately go and read everything that was said about me and quite a few really ugly things like i said people get ugly they just, a lot of people cannot keep normal constructive argument going. They just get ugly or they get ideas in their head that have nothing to do with anything and they keep pushing it through as a fact and the truth. 
and and other people who dislike you and uh, they do it in a passive aggressive way like for instance i i remember i was in australia where i did the same thing on the forums i i stood up for this particular marginalized group i suddenly you know i'm having a really good day and i was i was having a lovely day i was taking a walk going shopping and suddenly i get this message uh through a messaging system on the forum where a woman actually goes and on the surface it looked like a very sympathetic message she goes oh don't you worry about this person you know the i think they're full of shit and whatnot so she brought something to my attention which i was not aware of and i probably wouldn't be aware of and so because she did it and the way it was a fairly long message that implied that you know some serious stuff is going on so i had to go look and it was extremely unpleasant and so i had to respond meaning i had to engage and yeah so that's example of how you can't really avoid that so anyhow back to you know i'm no longer doing any of it i was very happy like i'm glad i've done it i don't regret it i you know i'm glad i i could help some people but i was very happy to be done with it i do none nothing of the sort here in the states and i can tell you i never want to do it again i, I was invited to because people from here you know it's internet is worldwide i was contacted privately several times by members of similar groups asking me to weigh in and this and that and i i just want nothing to do with it it's extremely extremely hard on you i can like i said i've seen people that close to nervous breakdown and i can imagine it could because extreme stress does lead to heart attacks and various other things and so no i, I want to live a good life i feel like i've done my work so now to the point of this whole video the, there is a reason i'm telling you these stories and the reason i was upset so there was a news piece on channel 13 um two days ago by channel 13's chief investigator Darcy Spears who talked about a recent string of burglaries and how it was solved I'm gonna put the link to it I'm gonna try to find the link there is a link on channel 13 and put the link so you know what the talk is about but I can tell you the story in in a compressed format so a couple three weeks ago there was a string of burglaries in an affluent neighborhood in Summerlin in Northwest. And in fact, Channel 13 reported on it. It was nine burglaries like that in, in short sequence and pretty, when I say violent, like the guy was taking rocks and throwing them through the back doors. He had absolutely didn't appear. He had any regard whether or not people are inside the home. Some of it was done in the daytime. He was caught on the sec private security cameras of the residents. So it was pretty scary. I'm gonna say if this was happening in my neighborhood, I was I would be more than a little concerned. Well, the whole and they did, and then they reported that the burglar was caught. Police got him. He he he's been held. That's it. Well, what Dorsey Spears made the follow-up piece on that apparently it so happens that sheriff, our sheriff, lives in that neighborhood and um someone from the department so not the sheriff himself but the area commander for that area so it's northwest area command and the area command captain larkin um captain sasha larkin she distributed internal memo which directed um the officers on duty to patrol every hour to, to, to do the foot patrols to question um speak to the residents question all suspects because remember he was caught on camera so there was a, the photo of him so question all male suspects that match the description she also mentioned that um division chief would be driving by and it was very and someone inside the department took a screenshot of that memo and obviously disseminated to to, to media to, to channel 13 to be specific well for starters it was an internal memo and i hope the captain larkin looked like a very capable woman i hope she does internal investigation finds out who that is it takes because i i know there is the appropriate disciplinary action for doing that that sort of thing but anyhow doris's whole big story was like oh well it's because the valley stop cop lives there that that's why this was done is it the standard procedure she interviewed captain larkin which told her that look for that week that was the biggest 
violent crime going and so that this is how we distributed our resources this is why we did the, what we did and in the end we were successful because they were oh, also in that memo she said um sheriff will be out of town um, nothing could happen to his home like you know make sure and this and that okay well you know before anyone jumps to conclusions which a lot of people do let's analyze situation so Captain Larkin, obviously, sheriff is her, so to speak, he's her boss. Well, he is. He is the boss of all the police department, and she is area commander, so he's definitely her boss. As you can imagine, in any organization, you don't want your boss to be unhappy with you, and you imagine, you know, it's a normal reaction. Sheriff probably wouldn't be happy if his home was burglarized. Not to say he, I don't think he would have taken out on her and whatnot, but as a regular employee, it has nothing to do with the sheriff, actually, in my opinion. She made, um, she did risk assessment and she did some critical thinking and she came up with the plan of action, which I think was an excellent plan of action. As a, and, and it resulted in catching the burglar. So... You know, she did, she came up with the plan, she executed the plan, the plan was successful. So let's just stick with that. But let's just say, you know, hypothetically speaking, this, in my opinion, she was in an impossible situation. Let's say she didn't take any proactive steps, okay? So she just said, okay, well, we'll just look into it, you know, just see the, send the detective, see what they can find, whatever. You know, basically not pay any special attention to this, despite the fact that there is a string of nine burglaries in pretty small community. That community is not that big. It only has two dozen homes. So that, that's a big deal. Well, let's say she didn't. And let's say Sheriff's house was burglarized. Well, I bet you anything, it would make the news because, you know, they listen to the scanners. They'll make it the news. And the commentary would be, well... Our police is obviously inept and incapable. If they couldn't keep their own sheriff's house safe, I mean, what chance do we stand? I, I can totally see that. Same Dorsey Spear is going in that direction. And if they would catch the burglar after that, the commentary would be, well, of course, after sheriff's house got burglarized, then they threw resources on that, and then they caught him. So, like I said, Captain Larkin had... There was no win in that situation. And she, in my opinion, she took the best possible course of action she could take. And she succeeded. She achieved desired result for everyone. Because the residents obviously were living in fear. And, you know, the public did not feel safe. And she made sure that everything was made right. Police did their job. Captain Larkin did her job. Okay? So, this is... And for... Any news outlet, doesn't matter, Channel 13 did it. And it, to be honest with you, it seemed like Darcy Spears has some kind of personal issue with, with the sheriff because she's gone after him before on some random issues and she doesn't seem to be interested in any other public officials, of which we have so many. But she just wants to, to get to the sheriff. Okay, well, that's, again, sounds to me, I'm a clinical psychologist, sounds to me like there's some kind of backstory to it. And it, it's personal. It has nothing to do with anything. But all right. So there is that, but let's look at the bigger picture here. And this is the reason I told you that second story. Let's look back at 1 October and the aftermath of that. As you all remember, Sheriff made the decision to be the face, to be, to be the face of investigation, to speak to everyone. And so every day, sometimes several times a day, he went up, and he he did everything he could and he succeeded in a keeping people calm remember how i told you about mass hysteria and what could happen so very quickly so he kept people calm he presented himself as a leader which and and, and he did he made sure that everyone felt safe he made sure the city kept on running. He basically redirected because there were a lot of people upset, angry. You know, there's all kinds of emotion happens when, when this sort of thing happens. He made sure that that energy was redirected into the positive channels, like donating the blood, you know, helping the victims, doing the healing garden, you know, all these things. It, it was all redirected. And he stood there and he did now remember Yes, he is the sheriff, but he did not have to be a spokesperson. 
This is a very big police department, the largest one in the country. He's got 3,500 people, I believe, under him. They have public information office, meaning they could have appointed a spokesperson, a random spokesperson who could have went up that podium every day and just gave the update and sheriff could be doing what he's meant to do, meaning investigating. And also that investigation was um, led by FBI, so he could have let FBI do the updates, which I'm sure they would have loved to take a lot of credit and whatnot. They had some TV time, but he didn't. He made the decision because, in my luck, like, I, I can't really speak for the sheriff, but I'm going to guess because he genuinely cares about his city, he cares about his people, he took it very personally and he wanted to make sure that he continues taking care, meaning keeping everyone calm, keeping everyone informed, making sure that the city is holding it together, basically. Now, when he made that decision, he's a veteran police officer and he's, you know, it's not like he was a patrolman before he was a sheriff. You know, he was promoted many times to head of various departments. And he is readily familiar with internet and media and what it's like. So he knew when he made that decision, he probably inwardly took a deep breath because he knew what was coming at him. And by God, it came. Those of you who read, you know, again, forgive me for using the word, but there is no any other word to use. There was avalanche of shit that came at him every day at every hour. He was called names. He was accused of all manner of things. All kind of wild theories were circulating. People took it personally. He, like personally, personally. People um, on some YouTube videos, people uh, got to his family in terms of, you know, they were investigating his wife. Um, there were all kinds of wild things. People came to he, to headquarters demanding to see him when they had absolutely nothing to say to him. And they made videos about that. People claim that he's blocking their cell phone signal. Good Lord. And I can tell you, and now you know from the story, that's why I told you the story, from the personal experience, I know what kind of personal price he paid for, for choosing to be a leader, for choosing to stand there in front of the cameras every day and, and to do what he did. So the reason I bring it up, it's barely been a year. Did we already forget? And I'm directing this pretty much to Channel 13, Darcy Spears, and those who supported that news investigative piece that she did. You know, I was brought up to be grateful. We need to be, we have to be. We have to be grateful to those who help us, who, who try to take care of us, who genuinely care. Did you forget already? It's only been a year. You, can you imagine what kind of personal price Sheriff paid for, for doing what he did? And he's still paying. There are all kinds of things on, online. And like I said, you can't avoid it. You can't ignore it. It gets to you. It, you, you. I can't even tell you. Unless you've been in that situation, you don't know how deep it gets to you. So, yeah, I'm a big believer in karma. Show some gratitude. Be, don't, don't have short memory. This is... This is something you have to remember. We, we can't forget. And, and like, that's why it, it upset me. It's trying to make basically a soundbite. That's all it was because it's all going to be, even today, it probably already washed off and then people forgot all about it and will be forgotten. But doing things like that, in Russia, we have a saying, Paboise Boga. We, I'm not going to translate. It's not. A, it, it's not a, anything curse or anything. It, it's. It, it's just kind of hard to translate, so Western English-speaking people will understand. But honestly, I sat in there and I thought, decidedly uncool. And among other things, which is something I, I, I kind of thought was really irresponsible on on part of Channel. Th 13 and Darcy Spears is she basically outed Sheriff's personal home location to general public. And yes, generally, because I, I did post, I, I usually don't get involved with, like I said, nowadays I don't get involved, but I posted little comment that was decidedly irresponsible um, 
to do that sort of thing because he has a family, he has a wife, he has a daughter, he has an elderly father. They have nothing to do with his work or how he does things. And there are so many nutters out there, which clearly all you have to do is look through YouTube and comments and whatnot, and you can see just how many nutters out there. And some of them actively were trying to get to him, like to get to his person, to do whatever they say to speak, but with nutters, you never know. And um, she did, she outed not only, she specifically named his community, they made sure they show aerial shots and they made sure they specified the name of the golf course, which, you know, is part of that community. And though, in theory, yes, all the real estate records are public. However, I used to sell real estate and I can tell you anyone, you don't have to be anyone prominent, it's not a secret, it's not cheating. You can veil your records through use of corporations, through use of trusts, so it's not readily available to every Dick and Harry who just goes onto the recorder's page, meaning you, you can't find the address of, of, a, of a certain person. You put the name in and you can because if it's veiled through a corporation or through the trust, then of course putting the name in the search is not going to give the result you want. And I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know, I haven't actually tried to search, but I'm pretty sure Sheriff probably done it just to protect his family, not, not because he's trying to hide anything, but... You know, and, and she done that, and to me, it was decidedly uncool. But anyhow, um, sorry if I bored you with this long video, but like I said, this is my channel, and I thought it bothered me. It, it did bother me, and I, I, and I thought about it for a few days, and I thought I'll just bring it out there, okay? Thank you, everybody, and have a fantastic weekend.